time. Welcome to the Accountants Connection webinar series sponsored by Your Business First. Good afternoon and good morning everyone wherever you are around Australia. Darren Sherry here, CEO and Principal Consultant of Your Business First. Today we have the pleasure of having David Gorman, CEO and Managing Director of DCG Consulting Proprietary Limited, presenting today on business succession and estate planning, asking the difficult questions and uh, providing, the providing with the difficult answers. During his 40 year career, David has seen and managed many transitions on, of client businesses and estates, some with not so optimal outcomes due to poor planning and structuring, and in worst cases, poor selection of executors and administrators. David today will talk to you about the issues you need to consider when providing advice in this area to your clients. From your client's business startup to the sale of their business and their legacy, they will talk about the processes you need to take to ensure an optimal outcome for those concerned and beyond. Thank you to everyone who said submitted questions. And if you have a question during the webinar, please feel free to click the Q&A button to enter your question and we'll attempt to answer accordingly and of course anonymously. David has a lot of content and knowledge today, so let's get started and let's get straight into it. So David, welcome and, thank you, and thanks again for your time. Thanks Darren and uh, hello everybody. Mm. Um, as you'll see on this first screen, I have a slightly different terminology to what most people have when they refer to estate planning. Uh, my definition brings in an additional concept called legacy planning. So most people think estate planning is talking about your will, but that to me is your legacy. The estate is really your retirement plan. Uh, your estate is what you have now and what you have to deal with and how you best do it. So there is a big opportunity here that uh, we're just getting into the baby boomer generation moving into retirement. It's actually already happened. And as you'll see there towards the bottom, probably about 15% of the small business market is about ready to retire. There's a lot of wealth being built up. There's been a lot of discussion lately about the, uh, the, the, the millennials who can't afford to buy a house because the baby boomers have got all the real estate tied up. And if that's the case, then there's a lot of wealth going to be passed on one way or another. On the other side, a lot of these small businesses are being undermined by technology advances, which is the threat. And are people going to get out with the sort of money that they really want? Here is most people's view of their succession plan, which is not a very good uh, way of approaching it. They are hoping for the best. Option two is probably buying a tax lotto ticket. So as they say, when you don't have a plan, you still have a plan. But the plan by default is that you are a deal taker, not a deal maker. Well, the process we're looking at here is to try to put everybody into a deal maker position. Another fundamental factor of the baby boomers is that they are living longer. And most people don't seem to appreciate the fact that their estate retirement phase will possibly be about the same length of time as their business phase, about 30 odd years. Now, if you've been dealing with your clients as a good small business advisor, you'll have been working with business plans with them. Why would it be any different when you move into retirement? You've got all this money. Yes, a big bundle of money. What do you do with it? May need to get the financial planners involved, but now we have 30 years to manage it. You can't just do set and forget. A financial plan in my book is actually no different to a business plan. It has to have the same continuous improvement circle. Plan, do, check, act. Act usually means replan, but you can't let that run for 30 years. You have got to be looking at it every couple of years. So that needs to be built into the, into the system. So number one, we're looking at the sale of business process. 
that can take two to five years in most instances. We have a whole, well, we could, we could run a, a, a full day seminar on the sale of business process. But again, this is the sort of thing that Darren is heavily involved in, trying to improve your business to maximize the value. There is a whole set of processes that you need to get into your clients thinking, improve their business over two to three years, then start to sell it. If it's, I mean, unless you've actually got them ready to go now, but in most small business cases, that is not the, not the, the, the situation at the moment. The investment of the proceeds, yes, as I said, that's when uh, we need to get some financial planners involved. If you're a registered financial planner, that's fine. You've got it all wrapped up, as you'll see when we come to the next uh, slide. It's then the death wills and binding death nominations that need to have an orderly transition. And this is a place where there are a lot of traps and it's very easy to have mistakes that can have serious consequences as we'll see later on when we get to a couple of case studies. And then there's the legacy. Legacy is the next generation. Why would we think that just because the person who may have been originally your client, the husband or the wife who may have come in and is running the business, when that person sells their business, goes into retirement and then dies, that we've actually lost a client you've actually lost one person. But if we take the approach of dealing with the whole family as our client and set up intergenerational transfer, there is a client for life, probably multiple clients, because as the generations move on, you'll get new branches, sons and daughters moving into grandchildren, continuous, <coughs> excuse me, continuous clients, which is good for your own practice, sale and succession that you've built up long-term client base for your own practice. If you've got that, if you've got this whole system in your, in your client base or in your practice, then you've actually built the longevity there. So let's have a look at this process. Who controls the process? My belief is that the accountant is the most appropriate person to be in control of both the business sale and then the ongoing retirement factor and into legacy. We are the ones who actually deal with the client all the time, year on, year in, year out. Most of the other people around that circle will be involved at various stages. I'm not saying they're, they're to be shut out, but they tend to only have occasional contact other than the financial planner. Again, you probably should have very good links with a financial planner as part of your business. As Darren knows, I've just actually merged my practice with a financial planning firm, for this very, partly for this very reason, uh, building in this sort of longevity and um, call it one-stop shop um, facility for the clients. So we really are the natural party to be at the centre of the process. But maintaining it long term says you must build that family relationship all the way along, not just with the one person who, who is in control of the business at the moment. Who, who comes next? Do you have a relationship with their children? And do we have the control over this process of moving it to the next generation. So it is fraught with difficulty. And here is what we're going to deal with when we hit that big trigger point when someone dies. Can we keep the family happy? Those who know their Anna Karenina will know that at the end, it's a train wreck. What we want to do is avoid the, the train wreck. Yep. <coughs> so systems for good planning and structures. We all know when someone comes in, they want to set up a business. We always say, get the structure right, 
from the start. That applies equally moving into retirement and legacy transition to, um, uh, to the next generation. Um, even just talking about a few, you know, I'm not really going to talk about tax or anything like that today, but if assets are kept in, 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 in trusts and company structures, we can avoid a lot of uh, capital gains tax on, on death, even though the rollover provision is there. Um, essentially, it's the same thing. Eventually, it will need to happen, but it, it's maintained and is in a controlled position rather than having a potential capital gains tax trigger dropped on you. Again, it comes back to this fundamental word control. Keep control of everything. So if we've got the money in the bank, yeah, as I've said, a business plan for retirement. 30 years needs a plan. It can't just be left uh, to whatever happens. Next slide. Yeah. Um, so to get this working, we do need to set up a full financial plan. We probably all know what they look like, but do we actually look at the structures, review the structures and update them regularly as things change? And have we actually looked at what is the succession plan, the legacy, how it's going to be passed on? Because if we get into um, a transition of companies and trust structures. There's the question of, can these things actually be passed on in your will? Or how do they have to be done in a different way? Now, here are the range of, of um, a range of control mechanisms uh, that we can use along the way. And I'm not sure how many people have actually gone through any of these with their clients. Sometimes the lawyers will talk about putting in a power of attorney, power of appointments. But everybody actually needs to look at all of these issues and, and have them in place. Um, they're, they're, they're not just um, whims and not just on death because some of those things cease on death, like a power of attorney. We need to look at the structures that can transfer to the next next generation and who has the control of them. Again, my emphasis is not worrying so much about the dollars per se. That's what people get tied up in when they're re doing their will. But the dollars can become semi-irrelevant if the wrong person has control of them. You think you may have left them in an equitable fashion, but if someone can circumvent that, and send the dollars in a different direction, it doesn't matter whether the dollars are big or small. It's a problem. So who are we going to pass it on to? Who are the appropriate people? Are these people suitably skilled? Or like with a business plan and a succession, like if you want to do a family succession plan with the next generation, they need to be brought in and trained up. Financial planning is a bit, bit the same. In fact, I had one yesterday where he's saying his son has no idea and is actually has no interest in managing his investments, yet he will inherit them. So here is a person who could inherit a couple of million dollars, and who knows whether it's tomorrow or in a couple of years, but if he has no idea what it's all about and how to manage it, he could just end up wrecking the whole system, even though we've set up very good structures for this, this particular client. So who is the right person for the task? And in some cases, should independent parties be appointed? Not necessarily fully as trustees, but possibly jointly with a family member if the family members don't have the right skills or time. They can, of course, simply engage accountants, lawyers, and pay for the service. Technically, they are still 
the one in control signing all the documents. But sometimes there's a case for an independent party becoming a um, uh, a joint trustee. So, Dave, are you saying are you saying that um, if you know it's 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 not just in the will where so if if um, say for example the the parents they've got you know a couple of million dollars um, they pass away and um, in the um, in the will can they can can they sort of like have or as far as the structure is concerned that you know maybe one person or one of the children manages the uh, the money or uh, how it's going on, or it doesn't does it have to be divided up equally among all the um, all the children if they've got multiple children? Well, the control can be one. Yeah. So would they have a the distribution might be spread amongst the, a number of beneficiaries, but the control can be left with one. Okay. But that's the day. But that's where there's a danger. Hmm. Are they the right one? You know, we, we know about total power leads to corruption. Yeah. That's what we want to avoid because those other ones who are relying on that one party could be being diddled out of their inheritance. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. Um, now, the, the, the other issue here, of course, is the uncertainty factor. We don't know whether we're all going to live for 30 years after retirement. Maybe, maybe not, but the possibility is there now with advances in medicine that we're all going to live a lot longer than the previous generation. What we have now is the known unknowns. You do know death is around the corner. And might I say, one of the problems with this is a lot of people are not prepared to use the word death or accept that they're gonna die. I guess that's one of the things that I've found not too difficult. Well, it, I won't say it's not difficult, but prepared to confront it and talk to people about the fact that, yes, you are going to die and how are we going to deal with um, uh, your assets and, and what, is, what is the plan? Try to get the plan in early. Um, yes, you can put insurance in place, but it, insurance will only cover the dollars. It does not cover who takes control. And as we said, it's not just a question of when you're going to die, what happens before you die? Are you going to get dementia? Are you going to get Alzheimer's? Are you going to be in some other way um, incapacitated? Who takes over? Who are the powers of attorney or guardians? Who will make decisions even though you haven't died yet, but you can't make the decisions? So again, all of this needs to be part of the plan, not just think about it when the time comes, because when the time comes, in fact, it's often too late. You cannot change a will after someone has lost capacity. So let's get in there and, 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 and do it as early as possible. Um, when it comes to structuring, there are a range of ways of doing it. As you can see here, I think most of us are familiar with superannuation funds. I'm not sure how many people think about an investment company as part of a retirement package with the introduction of the 1.6 mil cap and the no longer able to contribute after reaching the 1.6 million, people could end up now with a lot of money outside super. So should it be in their own names? investment company, investment trusts. If you've got some very, very large clients, we can think about charitable foundations and or a family office structure to manage things. So there's several you know, options there that may not have been thought about beforehand. And how do we move into the legacy stage from that? All of those, as I said, retain all of the above, but when, when you have a will, you can actually set up new types of trusts, testamentary trusts. There are ongoing life interest tenancies that can be set up on, on assets. In other words, that the, um, the ultimate beneficiaries may be your grandchildren, but your wife or spouse can have a life interest in, a, in that asset for the rest of their life under a, under a life interest, but they don't actually own the asset. 
there are some dangers in that. Um, one case that I had was that uh, the, the the wife mother had had the life interest, and um, well, the kids started to think she was living too long <laughs> because she lived the thirty odd years after her husband died. They were getting itchy to get their hands on the assets, and the other and, and another thing with those is is a problem of um, tying them up too tightly because as circumstances, investment um, uh, things change, the, um, if it's too tight, you can't actually change the investment. Can you turn the investment over and still retain the life interest in it, in a new asset? That sort of question. So over 30 years, that can be a problem. And of course, there's the reversionary pension options in, in super funds to, to consider. A lot of beneficiary considerations need to be taken into account. Yeah, who are the beneficiaries? It's not just um, the, the, the deceased party, but looking at the next generation, are there vulnerable beneficiaries with physical or mental disability that might need to be looked after or provided for separately from those who don't have those deficiencies? And what about problems with the beneficiary either if they, uh, you know, the next generation, your child might be might be running their own business, may have potentially large liability issues, you know, running a business. They could be a doctor. Uh, who knows? Um, that you you want to watch watch out for creditor bankruptcy issues, marriage breakdowns. A lot of people have concerns about their assets being hived off to the in laws side of um, uh, of the fence rather than staying within within their own children's line of succession and getting to the really complicated people with blended families how does that how does that get divvied up equitably so what's blended families don't children from multiple marriages his hers and theirs all right <laughs> okay you know yeah. so yeah where, where did the assets come from which children should be getting the money So, yes, we need to consider a lot of this very, very carefully and try to think it through and what might happen. My, 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 my one question over all of this is what if? Whenever you see a clause in a, in, a, in, a, in a will or a deed, what if? And we'll see some of that when it comes to the, um, the case studies that I've got following this. So another, another one that people get wrong here is who can actually receive superannuation death benefits? So we know we know about the binding death benefit nominations, but if you want to go outside the direct lineal descendants, then you need to go via the will. But again, you there's a potential there for for creating a conflict of instructions if people don't understand it correctly and get the instructions right. So at the moment we have conflicts turning up between reversionary pension versus um, lump sum payout and between binding death nomination versus wills are, are cropping up. They're starting to materialise already if you um, have a look at the, the legal cases. So I've highlighted a few. Let's just have a look at a couple of examples as to how things can go astray. Many of you may have seen or heard of the I Apollo case, uh, which I think shocked a lot of people. <clears throat> and um, I think everybody jumped on the fact that there was no binding death nomination. The, um, uh, the case here, um, was that Mrs. I Apollo died and in her will, she expressed the desire that her, the money from her self-managed super fund should go to her children. She had separated from her husband, but they had remained in the super fund after separation and they were joint personal trustees. So as I said, most of the attention and, and I hope everybody is aware now that you can actually make uh, non-lapsing 
binding death nominations. Um, back at the time of this uh, case, they had the three year term. <coughs> the case that the children brought, because they were the executors of the will, was to say that they, as the executor, should step into, into place as the second trustee, <coughs> take the second trustee position, the mother's trustee position. They were wrong. It was a major flaw in their case, a major misconception that the, that the executors step into positions such as trusteeship. Mr. I. Apollo, the remaining member, did what the CIS Act requires that he, within six months of date of death, created a corporate trustee and made himself the sole shareholder and director, and then transferred or rolled her superannuation entitlements to his account within the super fund. And as the judge said, all legally correct, I can't do anything about it. Case of legally correct, probably morally wrong. But that's what the law said. He did what the law required. But let's look at a couple of the other issues, which I don't think have, have um, had the same airplay as just fix it with a, with a, a non-lapsing binding death nomination. What if there had been a corporate trustee in place in the, in the first instance, rather than being personal joint trustees of this super fund? Then we would have had the case of Mrs. I. Apollo's share in that trustee company was an asset under the will, where her death benefits are not, her, her superannuation death benefits are not. So the children as executors would have had control of one share along with the, her husband, the other one. Now, then they probably would have had deadlock as to who was going to be appointed a second trustee. If a second trustee absolutely had to be appointed, but they would have had some control over the situation as, <clears throat> as the second shareholder to try to wrest control or at least take equal control and keep him under control in terms of dealing with the, um, uh, with, the, with the transfer of her funds. Another thing that a lot of people forget or overlook is that most superannuation trustees provide a trustee's discretion as to how they will distribute the funds in the absence of a binding death nomination. <clears throat> so obviously a binding death nomination is all important. If that's in place, the trustees don't have a discretion to do anything else. So there was a fundamental one there of being uh, personal trustees rather than having a corporate trustee in place. And remaining in the self in the self managed superannuation fund together after separation. Not too many people have jumped on that one, but perhaps it would have been a good idea if she had rolled her funds out to another fund whether another self-managed super fund or a retail fund. If it had gone to a retail or industry fund, <clears throat> the trustees of that fund in the absence of a binding death nomination might well have decided to give it to the children based on her express, express desire in the will. But they have to look at the case. They, they have to look at all the circumstances. So there's another case where uh, the, 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 the superannuation trustees, which was one of the big ones, National Mutual, I think, um, uh, made a decision and they said, the, the, the trustees said that they um, had to take in certain things into consideration. Um, the, um, the, the decision on that one was that, yes, they did, but they had to take all the circumstances into account at the time of death not some um, consideration at a prior point. Uh, there, was, there was an issue there as to whether the, tru whether the trustees can actually be bound by uh, some sort of early agreement. 
in that case said the trustees have to take into consideration all the circumstances at the time of the death and distribution from the super fund. Move on to number two case study. <clears throat> this was a member with a reasonable self-managed super fund, $2.4 million with a taxable portion of 1.5. The member was diagnosed with cancer. And yes, we had a binding death nomination in place nominating the personal legal, legal personal representative, i.e. the executors of the estate, 100%. Not a problem. The, the, the member had a will which provided that the superannuation death benefits paid to my legal personal representative be shared equally between three children and a disability trust to be set up for a dis disabled grandchild. Paying out of the super fund to the will would end up with the 15% tax plus Medicare levy of 2% being applied to the $1.5 million on a full withdrawal. Oh, sorry, on a, on a, a death uh, payout. But being the clever accountants that we are, we said, hang on, if all of this money, now that we know that you're going to die within the next six months, if we pull all of that out, we will save the tax on $1.5 million. Quite a good tax saving. But what that would have ended up with is, well, at the date of death, the super fund had $24,000 in it, not $2.4 million. The clause in the will there saying that the superannuation death benefit paid to set up a disability trust for the disabled grandchild would have given her $6,000, the grandchild that is. This one had a good outcome because we looked at that first. Got the will changed <coughs> that simply said, no, no, no reference to the, to the funds, where the funds came from, just simply said, $600,000 to set up a disability trust. Then the rest of the rest of the of the estate distributed equally between the three children. Got in there in time when the person still had capacity to change her, her will and um, and save the case. We had our cake and ate it too in that one. But where one has to read the will very carefully and have a look at that. Is that a sense? Was it was that a sensible way to approach the thing? It's what the person desired. It's the lawyer had had written up the will to express it, but not enough flow through of saying. But what if? Is that two point four million still going to be in the super fund at the date of death? To have have included that dependent on the proceeds coming from the super fund. Otherwise, we would have had to get the three children, the beneficiary children to um, voluntarily agree to set up the disability trust. But of course, then it is not, does not come with any of the, the necessarily with any of the special circumstances of being a testamentary trust. And case study number three, this is one where I, I, I blame what I call Reliance on template. Where we have an agricultural business, mum and dad currently own it in a partnership. In their will, they have one son who is interested to, to keep running the business, the agricultural business. It's a fairly labour intensive sort of business, most agricultural businesses are. He's the youngest. The, the youngest child of three and the parents say, we in our will will give $250,000 in cash to our other two children to be equal value to this agricultural business that we're giving to child number three. But generically, the will has the clause that says, if any of the beneficiaries predecease me, then their portion will go to their children, i.e. the grandchildren. 
child beneficiary number three currently has three children who are pre and at primary school age. Where do we sit with primary school age children inheriting an agricultural business? How is that going to work? And is it going to end up with $250,000 worth of value to those children if that happened? Assuming that the, that, um, the youngest uh, beneficiary dies. Well, car accident tomorrow. Yeah. Not, not that he's unhealthy. No, not looking at that at all. It's just a pure case of saying, what if it happened? How are those children going to run an agricultural business that requires a lot of la labour input? Semi hamstrung. Now, even if we've got that business in um, another structure, a company or a trust, which is what we're actually doing, but that's partly just to crystallise the two hundred and fifty thousand dollar value for each of the three, and leave a debt uh, on the on the trust balance sheet saying two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, unless already paid. And that has to be dealt with as well if it, if it happens to be repaid at some point. Otherwise, if we go 10 or 15, 20 years down the track, the business could be worth a lot more than $250,000. But that's because the, the, um, the inheriting um, child has worked it and built it up. So should he be denied um, that increase in value versus the other two getting $250,000. Again, this is trying to lock it in at a point in time, a value at a point in time. We still have to deal with the problem of how to run that business if child number three happens to die or even get disabled in the near future. Because mum and dad, this is actually mum and dad trying to pass the business on, the get out. They're a fraction older than me. They're approaching 70 at the moment. It's, it's all getting a little bit too hard for them to, um, uh, to work that business. Um, and son is taking over, which is all well and good. But these are the problems that we have to um, try to overcome. So just a few fundamental basic issues, um, as I would call it. This is no one, no one trying to do anything dodgy. It is just where the succession planning and the writing up of the will has not been quite right. And it needs someone to pinpoint those issues and get them corrected before something happens. So who's best qualified to do that then, in, 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 from your experience? Well, going back to that circle, I'm only saying we are sitting in a coordinator role, if I can call it that. Mm. Obviously, we can't write up a will. We have to get the lawyers involved. Restructuring. Yes, we can advise in restructuring um, and work on, on restructuring to, um, to, to get assets into a company or trust structure, superannuation fund, whatever all that some of it needs lawyers some of it might need financial planners um may have to get those bankers involved because it might need shifting um debts and and security as part of restructuring so you're basically saying that um it's not it's it, it is a joint effort with those all those people in that circle we can't yeah yeah the accountant just can't do it on their own no 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 yeah. um uh, but it's it's as i'd call it who's in the centre um, coordinating the process right. and most importantly talking to the client and the client being not just the one person. Mm. It's trying to talk and rope in the whole family into what the, the, the overall estate is, whether it be the business or further on when it is just managing investments and then ultimately managing the will transition. Obviously, the more one can get into company trust structures, perhaps superannuation, and superannuation now has its own difficulties, 
you know, you know, we haven't even mentioned the issue of 1.6 million threshold. It's all well and good. You've got both mum and mum and dad sitting at just under $1.6 million. But as soon as one of them dies, if it's being left to the other one, the inheriting or res residual uh, reversionary um, party is now on 3.2. So we've got to deal with um, a transfer balance cap for that one. Mm. But that's the, the question. Do we stay in superannuation or pull it out in those circumstances? No one answer, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no slick answer on all of this um, because everybody's circumstances are, are different, uh, even if only mildly different <laughs> to the person next door. Even if you had people, two families who were in partnership in a business, you can't say that exactly the same succession plan will work, work for both parties. It has to go individually. So moving forward, we do need to look at very full and comprehensive assets and liability statements. And as, as it says here, we need to collect information on all family members who are potential to be a beneficiary of an estate, to work out their circumstances. Who, who, who amongst us actually knows the likelihood of somebody's grandchildren, one of them, their marriage, what profession they will go into, the liabilities that might come with being in that profession or business and who they end up marrying and whether it's a good marriage or a bad one in terms of the other half wants to get their hands on the, all the money. Mm. So um, <coughs> that, that all needs to be looked at very carefully. A, a restructure plan developed. Yes, we need to check out the current corporate structure, but look at what modifications could work in the circumstances and then move through client approval and implementation. Way back when capital gains tax came in, it was a case of, yes, we got hamstrung because you can't just restructure overnight. Some of this will take several years to move assets into a new structure, um, peeling off bits of capital gains tax in an orderly fashion, not an all in one hit in most cases if one plans it far enough in advance. If you don't leave yourself enough time, then you don't have very many options left. And then yes, obviously get it all, all documented and approved. <coughs> <coughs> so as I put it, there are three certainties in life, not two, death, taxes and change. Things will change. And the biggest change of all is the first one. Death, yeah, death is the biggest change because it's finite for one party and fairly traumatic for all those that are left around. Obviously, we can ease the, ease the stress significantly if we have things in order, all set up and placed in order. Um, and in fact, I'll quote the person from the superannuation example, case study two, um, her sister said to me afterwards that she went peacefully knowing that all her affairs were in order. So that's a very good feeling to have um, from, from my perspective to say that, um, yes, we, we sorted it all out and um, the, the person departing knew things were being left in good hands. Uh, Step two, maintaining control is the real key to success in all of this. Um, because if other people take charge, then you're left with what you're given. If you don't have control, then is it like a, a, a deal taker rather than a deal maker, that the control element ultimately creates the success. So who are we talking about here about maintaining control? Are we talking about the actual client or are we talking about the, um, the accountant? Um, no, it's the actual client. Yeah. But it's our job, as I put it, to make sure that the right people get put into the control positions yeah. and that control is there. Um, just for an example, uh, again, 
how many people have looked at and incorporated into their will the appointment, their appointment position, the appoint, the, who is the appointor of a, of a family trust. If the, if the appointor dies, you actually have to go to the Supreme Court to get a new, a new appointor put in place. So that, that I mean, the appointor is a, is a significant controlling um, position in a family trust. The appointor has the power to remove trust, remove and replace trustees. Mm. But likewise, you don't want the wrong person getting in there who can remove trustees at a whim and put themselves or, or somebody who is their crony in place to take total control of the assets in the trust. So, as I said, every client is different and we have to look at their own specific issues. No one size fits all. And my good planning, plan early and review often. So uh, that's where we're at over this one, um, Darren. Um, if anybody's pinged in any questions, um, yeah. I think we, we did have a... Um, you got a couple. Yeah. Yeah. So um, thanks very much for that, David. I mean, just uh, I've seen David present this a number of times and the, and the more times I've seen this presentation, the more you know, uh, complicated um, it can be for, for a lot of, um, not only for the clients out there, but even for the accountants managing this on behalf of the client as well. So having a good team of people around you, like the financial planners, lawyers, etc., cetera, um, to help to, to do what's been the best, best interest of the, um, the client. I think that's, it, it, that just goes without saying as far as offering this as a service to, to, you, to your clients. So as you can see on the screen there, the, the, basically the, some of the range of services that David provides. He, I've known David now for about five or six years and um, um, he, he, uh, his practice, he's, the, this side of his business has grown substantially from a business succession and he's a planning point of view. So um, the amount of um, information that David's provided here today is only a snapshot of basically what also needs to be implemented as well from, from a client point of view. So thanks again for, for that, uh, David. Um, some of the questions that have come through is that, I'm not sure if the terminology this person put is right, but can the appointor of a corporate trustee or of, a, of an S SMSF be transferred to another member via a will or other instruments? Well, fundamentally, there is no appointor of a corporate trustee. Yeah. A, a corporate trustee company has shares and directors. Power to appoint directors rests with shareholders, as I put or discussed in the Apollo case study. Um, would have, you know what, what would have happened in uh, in the in the case if they'd had a corporate trustee in place there, and uh, question mark as to whether or not you can actually appoint in your by your will someone to take over your director position. Yeah. One for the lawyers. But my understanding is that is actually probably not valid. That you actually, well, let's go back a, a step. With a lot of this stuff, don't rely on the law. The first fundamental with all of these things, trust deeds and, and company structures is go back to your constituting documents, the trust deed or the, or the constitution. Does it actually make any provision? for how to replace somebody. Um, trust deed, the fundamental one, as I said, is the appointor. If you're the appointor of a trust, uh, of, a, of a, a discretionary trust, uh, then, um, then yes, you can actually bequeath that appointorship or should include it in your will. Otherwise, it could be left hanging. And a, a self-managed super fund itself, the trustee doesn't actually have an appointor. Well, certainly not a call to an appoint or uh, it's usually either set up by one of the members or uh, uh, sometimes the constituting employer, the employer, a, a business employer company. Okay. Another one's come in, David, is um, <coughs> the treatment of superannuation distributions on death of a member. Can you give any feedback? Well, again, we, we, we touched on that uh, on a couple of points through there. 
the first fundamental to re remember is that superannuation, money in a superannuation fund is not an asset of your estate unless you make it so with that binding death nomination. Mm. If you, if you, and, and again, it's a way of um, uh, circumventing the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the drawn out process of dealing with an estate going through probate, etc. cetera. Um, you can actually just go direct from a superannuation fund to nominated beneficiaries. So we're always looking at, do we have reversionary pension, if it's in pension phase, do we have reversionary pension in place? first and and then looking at the the distribution uh via a binding death nomination again need to be very careful there because there's the, again the question mark people do both put in a reversionary pension nomination and a binding death nomination the binding death nomination is lump sum only which comes first Generally speaking, reversionary pension comes first. Mm. But do we actually want that with the 1.6 mil cap now? If it means the person receiving the reversionary, a reversionary pension goes over the 1.6, is that the best outcome? Or might they actually be better receiving that money out and investing out in their own name? Or possibly even receiving it if it's the spouse, there's no tax on it, even if it's taxable component, and the spouse may decide to do an advance distribution on, on an estate and spread the money around through, you know, to the children right there and then. Okay. I mean, there's a myriad possibilities of how, how it could be done. Yeah. As you said before, it's, it's a, basically a case-by-case -case basis. It's a very case-by-case -case basis. I mean, another one, uh, which I didn't actually put on the, on the slide there as such, but you, uh, there were the things creating testamentary trust, but you can actually also bequeath your assets into a family trust, maybe a pre-existing one rather than a testamentary trust is only is, is actually only created by the will. Mm. So you can't have a testamentary trust before you die, but you can have your family trust there. You can actually bequeath assets into that family trust direct. Have you, have you ever come across um, a client where they just don't care what happens? Oh, yeah, plenty. And, yeah. Um, well, and how, do you, how do you deal with that or how do you respond to that? Well, the simple one is how do you want to be remembered? If you say you don't care, but do you want to be remembered as that silly old bastard who left us with a mess to sort out? Yeah. Because that is, you know, probably... How you will be remembered is by, by that final act, if it is a problem. If it's all nice and neat, yes, everyone will have a lovely memory of you, probably even forget about what you left in the will and just remember you for what you were in your lifetime. But leave a mess on the will and that will be your lasting legacy. That's what people will remember. Okay. That's interesting, that. Keep their questions coming through, guys. There's some really good questions coming in. Um, where are you guys for referring clients so they get this right? Oh, well, I think it's your last page, Darren. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> After the questions. <laughs> but another one that's come through, David, is that, again, and I'm assuming a lot of, a lot of accountants out there who have, have um, been presented this problem as well, is that where the... Um, the children don't get along and the children don't share the same, I suppose, um, ideals when it comes to um, the family, the family estate. So um, what happens if, what happens if a, if a, if a parent wants to leave um, some, wants to leave um, um, his, his or her estate to one of one or two of the kids, not all the kids. Dangerous. Yeah. Well, obviously ripe for a challenge. Mm. Um, and again, it comes back to control factors. Um, we've seen it all. Um, I had one case where um, the daughter waited uh, about 15 years for mum to die before she inherited her half, where 
a substantial part of the assets, i.e. the family business was given to the son um, before the father died. Father died, everything else then left to the mum and, and all of that left to the daughter. In the meantime, over those 15 years, the, the son and the business, the business had gone belly up. Okay. And when, when daughter inherited, having waited about 15 years to get it, son comes back for another bite of the cherry. And despite the fact, well, it didn't end up as a legal case, it just ended up as a negotiated settlement. Okay. But, the, but if it had gone to court, the issue is not so much whether what he had already had, the, 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 the courts actually look at what is the need at the time. And since he had gone bankrupt and virtually didn't have any, oh, really? any funds or asset to live on, yeah. and, and the daughter was reasonably well off with her husband, um, pre the, the, the bequest, um, the court probably would have given him probably more than we actually ended up negotiating. Okay. Yeah. But the control factor is all important there as well because put the wrong person in control and the funds could go who knows which direction. Thank you very much for providing those questions, everyone. Um, I hope you got a lot out of it today. And as I mentioned before, um, it is a, um, a process and, a, and an offering that can be very, very complicated and you need the best people around you to make sure that um, not only we dot the I's and cross, cross the T's, but make sure we have a, um, an optimal outcome for everyone. So as usual, as part of the Accountants Connection webinar series, there is, there is an, an, an offer. Um, have a book and an obligation-free session with an experience and appointment with uh, David directly. I'm sure um, most, if not all people on the webinar today have maybe a, a one or two clients who may have a complicated um, 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 estate or have a complicated um, issue that they need to deal with. Um, let's get David involved and see what he, what he says. So, as you, and from a, um, again, from a privacy point of view, is that if you've got any issues or if, um, if you'd like to um, book a time to see David or have David contact you, email all your information to me and I'll, and I'll pass it on to David and um, he'll contact you to book a time and uh, make sure you have your list of questions ready and have the meeting with David and see how we can help you or provide the, um, some sort of uh, direction in relation to um, some of the issues or challenges you're having relating to this particular topic. So thanks again for your time again, David. Um, Pleasure, much appreciate, appreciated. Um, what we'll do is uh, we'll, it might be, um, um, we'll, we'll go through if, if, there's, if there's any other questions that come in, in um, after this and I'll pass it on to David and he can answer you directly. Thanks again for your time. Um, please look, at, look out again for the, um, another webinar in relation to the Accountants Connection webinar series and enjoy the rest of the day. Take care, everyone. Bye. <clears throat>